<sighs> I really wanted to have this done before now. The main reason I ended up splitting this monstrosity into two slightly smaller monstrosities and then releasing the first before the second was completed mainly came down to the fact that I had desperately wanted the whole thing to be finished and posted by the time Justice League came out, and when that proved to be an insurmountable task owing to a variety of personal and professional reasons, I resolved to at least get the first part out and stake out my claim. The fact is, what I wanted more than anything to avoid was to get wrapped up in the discussion of whether or not Justice League, if it turned out to be good or even simply better than the last one, which, let's face it, is setting the bar about as low as you can possibly set it, somehow redeemed Batman v Superman. Because, and let me be clear about this, it can't. Hey, so most of this was recorded before uh, having seen Justice League, so uh, now having seen Justice League, I can uh, definitely say that no, it does not redeem anything, and it also really doesn't try to. I mean, you can go read or watch my review of Justice League on geek.com. But far from redeeming Batman v Superman, Justice League is actively pretending that it didn't exist, which is odd because it keeps having to call back to obvious plot points, but also pretend that they happened in a completely different way. You know, it's this constant refrain of, Superman was a beacon. And it's like, wait, no, no, he wasn't. No, he wasn't. The entire plot of that last movie was that you and a bunch of other people, including, like, senators, thought he was absolutely not. And then, you know, spoiler alert, Superman shows up, and now he's acting like the real Superman, and it's not like, oh, he learned how to be Superman at last. It's, no, no, he was totally like this all the time. For forget all that brooding, moody, unsure of himself Superman from the last one. That never happened. Here's, like, flashback videos to prove it. It's... It's really quite something. But uh, yeah, Justice League uh, in no way, shape, or form tries to uh, mitigate or redeem uh, this particular film. So uh, uh, back to really that bad. It's the jacket, it's a little much, right? Here's the thing, even if Justice League or any other subsequent hypothetical related film did manage to drop in some kind of miracle retcon that explained away a nonsensical plot point or fixed a mischaracterization or particularly galling story point, that still doesn't actually ripple back in time and no longer make that element not a detriment in its original form in the original film. Yes, it might ease your sense of comprehension or make more sense when you're plotting out the beats and details of the DCEU meta-narrative on your own, if that kind of thing is your bag, no judgment here, but it can't undo the tangible negative effects of the original flaw on the original film proper. I don't care if Jeff Johns and Grant Morrison themselves collaboratively pen a stirring flashback monologue into the Green Lantern Corps movie wherein Tomar Ray reveals the shocking truth that Granny's peach tea was actually concentrated essence of the Parallax entity deliberately manifested into the Senate Superman hearings by Sinestro under the influence of Necron in order to create the level of fear and mistrust necessary to ensure Superman was distracted from preventing the deaths of Mercy Graves, Wallace Keefe, and Judith Finch because the specific condition of their respective life energies faded them as ideal candidates to become the first Black Lanterns, it's still a stupid moment that sticks out and mutilates audience engagement with the narrative flow of the movie that it's actually in, and it would be no more retroactively fixed by that kind of nonsense than having them turn up as characters in Justice League fixes stopping Batman v Superman cold so Wonder Woman can watch Cyborg, Flash, and Aquaman's EPK teasers, which it can't and which it never could have because that's not how cinematic storytelling, even serialized cinematic storytelling, works. And furthermore, I've actually got a lot more to say about that, but we really need to roll the credits now. And furthermore, obsessing over fixing mistakes you've already made for the sake of either continuity, answering fanboy criticism of your previous movies, or just trying to prove you were listening instead of focusing on telling good stories going forward, or, here's a novel idea, making the one movie you're working on in the present actually good is a big part, hell, quite possibly the biggest part, of how we found ourselves in this mess to begin with. And you know, it's probably time we talked about that. Oh, 
Okay, so if you're Warner Brothers Pictures, one of the oldest and most storied studios in Hollywood, best known public face of the obscenely powerful multinational Time Warner conglomerate, and owner of some of the most popular and profitable intellectual property in the history of mankind, including effectively the entirety of the DC Comics superhero pantheon, this is where you would have found yourself in the year, let's keep it simple and say 2010. The short version is, you're in a weird place. The blockbuster movie scene is in a period of uncertain transition, as it was becoming increasingly clear that the superhero genre, which had been largely largely dominating the box office and pop culture conversation space since the 1-2-3 punch of Blade, X-Men, and Spider-Man at the turn of the century, but which a lot of smart industry and industry-adjacent people figured had peaked with the release of your critically acclaimed smash hit The Dark Knight two years ago and was due to be on the way out, was actually getting what at the time looked like a second win. Not only was the genre not going anywhere, it had been all but fully reinvigorated by the newly launched Marvel Cinematic Universe, which found immediate and sustained mega-success with an upbeat, family-friendly approach rooted in faithfulness to the comic book source material and a shared universe gimmick that was catnip to the hardcore fanboys and drove the cultural conversation between releases. Of course, superheroes remaining the kings of Hollywood shouldn't have had to be bad news to you. After all, pretty much all of the properties in the genre that anyone cares about are owned between exactly two public Publishers, and you own one of them. You can make plenty of these things, as many as you'd like. Wait, do I own this one? Or is that the other guy? Except you've been trying to do exactly that for almost two decades now, and outside Christopher Nolan's Batman movies, you've been blowing it. Especially when it comes to a certain character called Superman. A project called Superman Reborn stalled out between 1994 and 1995 over script difficulties, then got resurrected as a proposed Nicolas Cage, Tim Burton, Kevin Smith collaboration called Superman Lives that fell apart so disastrously that Smith basically revived his career relevance by doing comedy lectures about how bad it almost was. Around 1998, you'd seriously considered a seven-part series based on a pitch from a comic book fan who'd never sold a screenplay before that, but then pivoted to a Superman vs. Batman movie to relaunch both characters with Wolfgang Peterson directing, only to see that one fall apart too in favor of a radically reimagined reboot script from J.J. Abrams called Superman Flyby that was to have been directed at various points by Brett Ratner, Mick G, Brian Singer, and others, and then wasn't because you decided to let Singer just do a sequel to the Christopher Reeve movies and Superman Returns instead, which got made and didn't really do it for people and didn't end up getting a sequel. Oh, then in 2009, you had an entire Justice League movie written, cast, plotted, and set to shoot under the title Justice League Mortal for director George Miller, and then you scrapped that on cost concerns because Australia changed their tax credit laws. And it was not the only one of these failures that got far enough into development that you were spending real money on it. So now your parent company is starting to take notice that in this so-called age of the superhero movie, trying and failing to make movies about the most popular hero of all time had been costing them money for well over a decade. Oh, and I hope you like ticking clocks, because now you've got two of them. First up, you just wrapped up a pair of court battles involving the rights to Superman with the heirs of co-creator Jerry Siegel, wherein you didn't lose your control over the property itself, hooray. This is how a democracy works. We talk to each other. But the Siegel family now had the right to sue you for lost revenue if you didn't get a new movie going by 2011. Second, the Harry Potter series, which had been effectively carrying your entire studio on its back for a solid decade, i.e. about as long as anyone then currently employed at the executive level had been with the studio, is going to end that same year and you don't have a guaranteed new recurring franchise to replace it on the docket. Speaking of which, have you noticed that in all of the now constant criticism of movies are turning into TV, there's too much serialization, everything's a franchise, why can't I just watch one movie, that Harry Potter never comes up? Like whenever something like The Mummy or Dark Universe happens and yet another cinematic universe shits the bed, everyone wants to talk about how Marvel and Warner Brothers and Disney and the X-Men movies and all the superhero stuff is ruining the movies by creating this serialized films as TV culture. But then Harry Potter, which basically comes down to Warner Brothers making a genre film version of Boyhood, but with like 20 child actors over a period of 10 years and parsing it out like the world's longest undertaking miniseries, that gets absolutely no flack about this. It, it's like a totally separate issue for some reason. I mean, shit. You know, if I didn't know any better, I might posit that the popular culture decided to give something a huge pass because everybody spent a decade being thrilled that their kids read a whole seven books. You think this is a better look? I think this might be a better look. Oh, and also that whole Marvel thing that had been kind of creeping up on your scene as a quaint little quasi-independent operation with a distribution deal over at Paramount? Well, things change and now they've got the mouse's money to spend. Tick. 
talk. So you decide to go all in on what seems like the best idea you've got under the circumstances. Another reboot, this time overseen and co-pitched by the guy who already saved Batman for you, directed by your new in-house big-budget action specialist whom the fanboys seem to love and who you've possibly got over a barrel because you agreed to pay for his weirdo passion project and maybe now he owes you some grunt work, this becomes Man of Steel, aka Things People Complained Weren't in Superman Returns, the movie. And it's not exactly a big success. It's a hit, it makes money, but not the money you were expecting, and certainly not enough to cover the still outstanding cost of all those aforementioned failures. Oh, and the reviews are pretty bad, the audience feedback is decidedly mixed, people seem to hate the ending, and the same fan sites that were riding your ass about Superman Returns not having enough action are now calling this one inappropriately violent, and you've already committed to this now awkwardly received movie as your soft launch for a so-called DC Extended Universe. So now what are you supposed to do? Exactly. You have to kind of sympathize with them at that point, right? And here's the thing. Despite how it all turned out, i.e. as this terrible movie you're now watching part two of a lengthy feature-length autopsy thereof, the series of moves Warner Brothers, Zack and Deborah Snyder, and other assorted interested powers settled on actually make a lot of sense. Like, if you can forget that you know how the story ends, the logic behind making Batman v Superman not only sounds you know, sound, seeing it come together as an initial plan must have felt like the goddamn second coming. I mean, think about it. Your solo Superman movie didn't do the job. All anyone wants to talk about in this genre is Marvel and the Avengers, and that means crossovers, continuity, and more stuff pulled directly from the comics. Now, you can't just jump right to Justice League, because that's a huge commitment and a lot of stuff to introduce, but you could maybe do a team-up movie. Maybe with Batman? Yeah, Batman. That guy always makes you money. And you've wanted to do Superman vs. Batman since back in 2001. Hell, you ended up going after Christian Bale to do the Nolan Batman movies, in part because he came in to test for Superman and that. Okay, so Batman and Superman. What do you do with those two guys? Well, yanking fragments from popular stories from the comics seem to be working out for the other guys. And hey, what do you know? The most popular Batman story, at least as far as any executive at Warner Brothers would know, given its consistently strong sales and paperback and the fact that the loudest voices in the fanboy set will not shut up about it, is The Dark Knight Returns. And that story ends with Batman fighting Superman. You could take stuff from that. Hell, just Batman in that suit of armor and the fanboys will be foaming at the mouth right off the bat. And as for Superman, well, there is also a Superman trade in that rotating, best-selling graphic novel of all time roster, but it's the death of Superman, which kind of seems like more of an ending than a beginning, which we also spent like a decade trying and failing to make into a... And you can almost hear the light bulb going off. Wait a second, you know how part of the story problem with Justice League is why does there even need to be a league of six other people when one Superman is already stronger and has better powers than all of them combined? What if, what if, we do Superman and Batman, or Superman meets Batman, or Batman vs. Superman, or whatever, and then at the end of that, the big monster from Death of Superman, Doomsday I think he's called, shows up and Superman gets killed. I mean, what an ending that would be. Nobody will see it coming, everyone will be shocked, the whole world will be talking about what gigantic balls we have to do that, and then that can be the plot of Justice League. Oh no guys, bad guys are coming and Superman isn't here to stop it anymore. So now all of us slightly less powerful heroes have to team up and handle it as some kind of suicide squad. And then Superman can come back like at the finale or in the next one and get a big happy ending. I mean, that gives you a pretty solid, what's that magic word? Trilogy. Part one, our two most merchandisable characters, maybe that one lady character because I've heard they're going to these movies now, and two fan favorite stories worth of fan service to earn a year's worth of breathless pre-production coverage from the fanboy press. Part two, and the rest. Part three, and the rest, now with more Superman. Objectively, that's a pretty strong pitch. I mean, obviously the casting, directing, screenplay, you know, the execution is going to make all the difference, but as a blueprint, if you're Warner Brothers, you'd be stupid not to at least commission a screenplay for that first movie and have some concept art and budget projections drawn up. And if you could get one of the most popular and reliable actors at your studio, a guy who just won you an Oscar and is in the midst of a career renaissance everyone seems delighted by, and who could maybe bring his considerable director's clout to bear on one of the spin-offs to play Batman, look, I know it's hard because we've all seen how the actual movie turned out and we know the whole Justice League will be two movies of its own thing, got torpedoed in the fallout, but as a starting point, that outline sounds like a movie I want to see. Why did you say that name? It's his mother's name. Unfortunately, I did see it. 
We all saw it. In fact, in the course of reviewing the film when it first came out, revisiting it to write later and produce more content about it, and then again and again in the writing of the scripts for this episode, I believe I saw Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice at least ten times, and if you count cycling back and forth through it in the editing of these episodes, I don't even want to think about how many hours that all adds up to. And yet, there is still so much about this movie that still baffles and confuses me, which is why, even though we've now established that the decision-making process that brought Warner Brothers to this point was actually rather sound in conception, I am nonetheless forced to still call the next segment... Let's be clear about something. This is not about plot holes. I don't care about plot holes. I don't care about logic problems. We're not doing jokes about the physics of how fast the Batwing flies or where Doomsday Energy Wave comes from or any other bullshit like that because this ain't CinemaSins and that's not what I mean when I say I have questions. What I'm talking about are decisions in the story and the telling of the story that caused the unwieldy, weak, nonsensical shape that the narrative structure finds itself in. Not why didn't this fictional character's actions adhere to my definition of logic or reason, but rather why did these filmmakers make their jobs so much harder and our or viewing so much more painful, and because I don't want to make this thing any longer than it needs to be, I'm limiting this to the 15 that I can actually answer, or at least work out the reasoning behind to some extent, because I care about you people. Why is it necessary for Bruce Wayne to see the destruction of Metropolis firsthand? Would he not have cared as much if he only heard about his building falling over? Are we implying that he wouldn't be anti-Superman if he didn't have to comfort that one little girl? I mean, this is the one superhero who no one is expecting to need an extra shove to get dark and vengeful. Plus, it's not like he goes directly from this to gotta kill Superman. Instead, he diverts his attention to Lex Luthor and KG Beast. Yeah, did you know that's who that was supposed to be? Or does he? I say again, plot holes and realistic logic don't actually matter as far as I'm concerned, except for when they are so absurdly glaring as to take a reasonable person not looking to start something out of the narrative itself, or they exist as evidence of bad writing and or filmmaking that otherwise impacts the finished product in a significant way. Are we clear about that? Okay, so, that Bruce Wayne has known Lex Luthor was smuggling kryptonite the whole time and that he unretired Batman not to protect Gotham from a dirty bomb like he says, but to steal it so he can kill Superman is intentionally held back as a reveal so he can be surprised at how far he's already fallen as a former hero. To keep it out of Luthor's hands. To destroy it. Got it, makes sense, okay. But does Lex know that? I mean, the eventual big reveal for Lex is that he figured out both of their secret identities ages ago and has been manipulating their mutual hatred from the start, which is stupid, lazy, bad guy from a lesser Marvel Netflix show plotting in itself, but whatever. Two years growing, but it did not take much to push him over, actually. Little red notes, big bang, you let your family die! Do I really look like a guy with a plan? And the only way for Batman to make sense as an opponent for Superman is if he eventually gets kryptonite, so it feels like we're supposed to assume that Lex somehow worked out that if he snuck kryptonite into Gotham in secret, Batman would find out and exactly how he'd decide to use it and when, and that's just too far. Luther is smart, but he's not a goddamn precog. There's no way he could plan for this without actually being able to literally see the future. Huh. You know, I bet that Kryptonian spaceship could have helped him work stuff like that out, though, if they'd written it so that he was already dicking around in there instead of having it be a thing that happens mid-movie. Huh. Also, if Bruce Wayne did already know what Kryptonite was, wouldn't he already have some? Is he not at least comparably rich and almost certainly better connected than Lex Luthor is, given that he's hiding a Batman-branded stealth bomber somewhere on his own property? That'd be less complicated, raise fewer additional questions, and he could still be investigating LexCorp because Luthor has the spaceship, and maybe he knows who Superman really is. You'd kind of have to assume that maybe he's hiding in plain sight under a secret identity is something Bruce Wayne would think of pretty early on. Why is Lois Lane in this movie? I mean, it's because she needs to be here because she humanizes Clark, but then they can't think of any other immediate reason for her to be around, and they know that if all she does is play love interest, they'll get dinged that 90% of the movie is a sausage party, so here's a dumb subplot about a bullet to point her at Lex. Question, why couldn't she be the one getting all righteous about Batman and digging into all that stuff in Gotham? She'd still end up on Lex's radar that way, since it doesn't require random trips to DC. Maybe we could get a few scenes with her and Martha Kent to establish this profound connection they're suddenly supposed to have at the end of the movie. Why does Lex Luthor only seem to employ about a dozen henchmen? This is a place where that lack of crowd size and extras mentioned in the last time really hurts things. It's an out-of-the-movie bit of weirdness that this super wealthy guy who's apparently been manipulating the government, the military, the media, and two superheroes as part of his big elaborate scheme uses the same handful of thugs under the same pit boss to do all of his wet work. Hell, according to Suicide Squad, there's piles of super criminals out there he could be subcontracting to. Now, this is kind of rhetorical because this is actually one of the things that does make more structural sense in the extended edition. It just 
changes from inexplicable to lazy and stupid. See, in that version, Kahina Ziri, the Nairomi woman played by Wunmi Moasku, who testifies against Superman, becomes more of a character in her own right, well, really more of a heavy-handed symbolic human prop, but yeah, and it's eventually clear that Lex uses the same guys in Africa and in Gotham so that she can recognize one of them and be spurred to complete her character arc, the purpose of the conclusion of which is lazy, tacky, bush league storytelling and borderline outright offensive, so you'd better believe we're coming back to that a little later on. Knowledge is power. And I am... <laughs> no. I, um, no, what am I? I? What was I saying? No. Why is Lex like this? I don't mean what is his condition, I mean what is this meant to tell us? What does it mean for his character other than, hey, this might be a thing to try? Are we contrasting him with Bruce Wayne as the more together, traditional rich guy? Are we emphasizing his youthfulness versus the two older good guys? Are we meant to be off guard and underestimating him? Those would all be valid, it's just that none of them seem to actually be the case. So instead we get another stereotyped tech sector caricature conflating potentially neuroatypical mannerisms with sociopathic supervillainy. Super. Why does Clark Kent suddenly give so much of a shit that Batman is violating criminal civil liberties? Like, hey, I'm glad he does. That's a very Superman thing for him to care about. It just doesn't seem like he does otherwise. From what we see, this Superman is really more of a big-scale accidents and natural disasters kind of hero. Also fine, but if you're gonna bring this up, it's not unreasonable to ask why he gets all up in arms about this when it's another costumed vigilante doing it for a couple of weeks the next town over, as opposed to, say, the police or the government doing it every goddamn day all over the country, hell, all over the world, selective outrage much, Mr. Kent? Look, it's a dumb overcomplication of the story that only exists because the film is desperately leaning on topicality to make the square peg go through the round hole in terms of Superman and Batman having equally reasonable issues with each other's methods. Especially since, well, not to start rewriting the movie, yet. But if Superman had, prior to turning his attention to Batman, become some hardcore protector of the downtrodden and marginalized, using his powers to protect, oh, I don't know, young black men from getting beat up or shot by corrupt cops, women being harassed and denied their rights through government oppression, indigenous people being forced off their land, I promise you, the US government would be holding hearings, making plans, and buying up kryptonite way the hell fast. Which would give you that whole Senate hearings media debate subplot in a much more topically charged context without demanding a stupid, convoluted African massacre conspiracy, hanging around, adding minutes to the runtime, and create a scenario where the only important black people in this movie, whose roles are not entirely about exposition, are there so they can get killed to become a subject of the exposition. Nobody cares about Clark Kent taking on the Batman. Crime wave in Gotham. Other breaking news. Water. Wet. Why doesn't Perry White want Clark investigating Batman? Okay, as we discussed before, Perry White being an embittered cynic who wants the planet to make money and survive by only publishing content that will sell, not the do-gooder journalism Clark Kent suddenly wants to do, is a revised characterization that actually makes a lot of sense. What doesn't make sense is that someone with that attitude would apply it in the form of, hey no, Smallville, I don't want you to chase after that lurid, sensational, eyeball-catching story of crime, violence, and vigilantism all taking place in our readers' backyards. Instead, write up the football game, aka something a newspaper of this size generally pulls off the AP these days. The Nightmare. We'll talk about that later. You're letting him kill Martha. Martha, Martha, Martha will be discussed in just a moment. Metahumans. We'll talk about that. You know, you know what? We can talk about part of this now. Why is Cyborg here? I don't mean here in the franchise. Look, yeah, it's kind of weird that he's here for the first ever Justice League instead of, like, Green Lantern, Hawkman, Martian Manhunter, Hawk Girl, Green Arrow. I mean, the Avengers didn't do the first movie with Iron Man, Thor, Captain America, Hulk, Black Widow, and Moon Knight. And I have a bow and arrow. None of this makes sense. <laughs> But the DC A-list does have a diversity problem, and thanks to the two Teen Titans cartoons, a lot of millennial fans are really big fans of Cyborg, so I'm totally on board with him being a founding member of the team here, sure. But why would Luther be keeping a file on what so far just seems to be a guy with advanced prosthetics in the same database as literal superhumans like an Amazon, an Atlantean, and a Speedster? Yes, we know he's here because the new backstory is that his robot parts are made out of a mother box, and that they need to seed the idea that that's a thing as much as possible so it feels less out of field when it becomes a thing in Justice League, but Lex doesn't know about mother boxes yet, to the best of our knowledge. These are old tapes, and we don't see anything indicating that he has any concept of them until we see the hologram of Steppenwolf at the very end. It's already clumsy and bad storytelling to stop the movie to watch a Justice League press kit full of trailers. This just makes it even more so. Also, and this probably should be one of those things that doesn't matter, but it's big enough to kind of matter, there's kind of a weird continuity error now in Justice League with 
Batman v Superman. You see, in Justice League, Cyborg tells Wonder Woman that the mother box that gave him his robot parts and brought him back to life and such started up the night Superman died because Justice League is really leaning hard on this idea that Superman's death was the catalyst for fucking everything that happens. But remember, and I went back to Justice League and watched it again to make sure and check my work on this one, in Batman v Superman, we know that's not the case, because the night Superman dies, the person Cyborg is now telling this story to watched a video of that very event with the Mother Box happening at some point in the recent past? I mean, again, I'm willing to forgive continuity errors and shit because it's a movie, but that is bizarrely sloppy. Why is General Zod doomsday if it doesn't mean anything? This just blows my mind, folks. Man of Steel does a lot of things wrong, but setting up Zod as a much more direct, dark parallel to Superman is a smart move, even if they ultimately only wanted him in the movie so Superman could have a big fight scene. So now he comes back in this one, revived and transformed into doomsday by Lex Luthor, and thematically this means absolutely nothing. He doesn't look like Zod, there's not a lot of acknowledgement that being made out of Zod's body is the reason he's fighting Superman, and not even Superman seems to think this is a big deal. Hey, Superman, your first arch enemy with whom you share an intense personal connection and whose death supposedly was some kind of gigantic deal for you is back, and you're reacting like this could be any giant random monster with any random origin. Okay. I mean, guys, this isn't even theorizing that this part of the story could be reworked to be more interesting. It's as though they tried to make it less interesting than it was in conception. Zod is kind of back, and Superman doesn't act like this is an important aspect of what's going on. He killed this guy, the effect of having done so apparently realigned his entire moral outlook between films, or at least so we're told, and he responds by immediately trying to kill him again without even a meaningful change in strategy. He doesn't even mention it to Wonder Woman or Batman when he's explaining what the monster is. That might have been useful information. Hey, he probably specifically wants to kill me, guys, so maybe he's not even interested in either of you. Maybe we can use that in formulating our plan of attack. Hell, the fact that he's still supposedly so affected by having to kill the original Zod could make him hesitate to do it a second time, which could have led to his getting killed himself and thus added a more emotionally resonant level of tragedy to his currently meaningless death. Why is Doomsday even here in any context? I mean, you know why. So that Lex can go, You're Doomsday. In the hopes that fanboys going, Ooh, a reference, will make a functional substitution for the complete lack of earned narrative engagement present in this stumbling disaster of a movie. Much like porting over the armor and the fight scene from The Dark Knight Returns, haphazardly regurgitating the death of Superman is another instance where the film chooses fan service over what's best for the narrative, and then doesn't even do the fan service well. It's enough to make one wonder if the powers that be at Warner Brothers have any strong driving ideas behind what to do with their DC movies beyond a list of which trade paperbacks sell really well. If it has to be Zod, why not have it be Zod again? Again. Sure, there's a little repetitive, but he could have new powers or whatnot, and more importantly, our big final showdown would be a battle with an actual character instead of a meaningless special effect whose existence doesn't mean anything to two out of three opponents. You could even finagle some way for Superman to get closure for how that last fight ended now that he's got two friends to help him. Or you could just forget Doomsday altogether, he's not really a great character to begin with, and they could be fighting, I don't know, Lex Luthor, the main villain of the film? Have him invent and use the strength-enhancing war suit from the Bronze Age Superman comics. I mean, you know, the one they might have already teased in Man of Steel, it would fit much better with this whole man-must-destroy-god-with-science characterization, and it would remove yet another pointless extra complication from this $300 million experiment in how not to write a screenplay and also to spend actually a lot more than $300 million. What are your superpowers again? I'm rich. What exactly is Lex Luthor's plan here? Okay, so remember a while back when we talked about how one of the ways Batman v Superman typifies all the worst elements of modern Hollywood blockbuster mindset is the way the screenplay prioritizes structure in terms of connective tissue and pedantic detail mongering rather than the tone and rhythm and flow of the actual narrative? The main way that manifests is the insistence on making Lex's evil plan an all-encompassing master scheme that's ultimately behind everything that happens that's even a little bit connected to it because for whatever reason modern studio mega producers love the whole I am the author of all your pain bad guy plot reveal, and they assume everyone else does too. But instead of explaining things, it usually ends up hurting the sense of plausibility. Batman v Superman asks us to accept the following was Lex Luthor's plan. 
Discovering the secret identities of both Batman and Superman, and then not doing anything with them. Diverting payments to Bruce Wayne's injured friend Wally in order to make him destitute and angry at Superman. Making sure that Lois Lane is on hand for a terrorist arms deal in Africa so Superman will show up allowing a group of Russian mercenaries also on Luther's payroll to carry out a massacre and make it look like Superman was responsible and force a local woman to give false testimony corroborating this in the media. Acquire General Zod's body and the remains of the Kryptonian battleship from the government. Convince Wally to become an anti-Superman activist by paying the medical bills Lex secretly screwed up for him so they can hide a bomb in his wheelchair and blow up the US Capitol while Superman is there and send Bruce Wayne mean letters so he'll try to kill Superman, which Luthor somehow already knows he wants to do because reasons? Kidnap Martha Kent and Lois Lane so you can force Superman into accepting Batman's challenge. Oh, and maybe also smuggle kryptonite into the United States via Gotham City because he somehow knows Batman will find out about it and try to steal it because otherwise how is tricking Batman into fighting Superman going to work at all? Yes, I know. I keep bringing this up, but it's such bad storytelling. And finally, if all that fails, turn on the machine in the spaceship that makes a monster that can kill Superman and just have him do it. Thank you for coming. I mean, wow. Just wow. That's amazing. And what's even more amazing is not only is all that conspiracy skullduggery just a giant pile of overcomplicated nonsense, if it even did make total sense, there's no reason for it to be there. Remember, the first new piece of information that Batman v Superman chooses to tell its audience is that Batman hates Superman and why, but instead of using the actual space in between that initial why they're gonna fight setup and the actual fight to build the characters, flesh out their world, or explore their differing views in detail beyond a vague out-of-nowhere angle that Clark Kent is specifically very concerned about the mistreatment of the incarcerated, which again is a good traditional Superman take but regardless makes no sense here, we get this giant elaborate conspiracy with no real point that doesn't even serve to set up the villains or the heroes for the next movie, which would still be bad but not this bad, or add anything meaningful to this one but rather turns out to be all an elaborate setup with the singular goal of making Batman hate Superman, something he already did, for the exact same reason he's hated him since the first five minutes of the movie. This movie runs the length of most whole movies between Bruce Wayne witnessing the destruction of Metropolis and Bruce Wayne turning on the bat signal to announce his intent to kill Superman, and not only is all of it a boring, confusing, ugly, unpleasant slog to get through, none of it actually matters at all. And speaking of stuff that doesn't matter, why is Wonder Woman here at all? I thought she was with you. Look, we've mentioned this a dozen times already, I agree, Gal Gadot is the MVP of the DC movie so far, and it doesn't look like that's going to change anytime soon. How does a man this large have almost no actual screen presence? And the Wonder Woman reveal is the big moment of fan service that actually works in the movie, but in terms of narrative and meta-narrative, her presence makes so little sense that she also kind of makes it worse because the story structure has to keep getting dumber just to fit her into the film. I mean, let's look at what her bizarrely prominent role in the story pre-Doomsday actually is. I've killed things from other worlds before. Bruce Wayne goes to Lex Luthor's big party so he can hack into the mainframe and steal information, but when he goes to collect it, it turns out that the mysterious super hot chick from said party is also doing high-tech thievery stuff and jacked his claim. Okay, cool. Solid James Bond type setup that we haven't seen from a Batman movie in a while. Nifty. Then they meet up again and flirt and she talks about ancient stuff and now if they hadn't blown the reveal a year later just to show off at Comic-Con, everyone who remembers how cute Bruce and Diana were on Justice League cartoon would be thinking they've got it figured out and getting excited and then, oh my god, it turns out she's Wonder Woman. Holy shit. Ah! And what she's trying to do is steal back a digital photo. Okay, that is the stupidest single plot point not only in this entire movie, but in the entire connected franchise so far. Yes, even all the stuff in Suicide Squad. I know I said I don't care about plot logic because, hey, it's a goofy-ass superhero movie, so maybe in this universe of flying solar-powered space messiahs and billionaire ninja furries, removing a JPEG from the cloud is a thing you can actually do, but it's a ridiculous stretch, and yes, I know in Wonder Woman they sort of clarify that she was just looking for evidence of where the actual photo might be, but that doesn't actually fix this movie, and besides... Okay, I'd still be willing to let it go, except for the reason it turns out to have been part of the narrative in the first place. To recap, Bruce Wayne gets the Luthor drive back, decrypts it, and discovers the photo that suggests the mystery lady is maybe some kind of time traveler or perhaps a sexy Highlander. And in an adjacent folder, he finds that Luthor has been connecting information on the existence of other superpowered beings, aka metahumans, all around the world, and also making custom superhero logos for them for some reason. That's another detail that's really dumb but would have been forgivable if the rest of the movie was better because because comic books. He then sends this information off to what we now know as Wonder Woman, and she's surprised to learn about it. What the 
hell? Seriously, what kind of sense does that make? She's supposed to be about 5,000 years old. She's been walking the Earth outside of Themyscira for well over a century. She is herself a magical superhuman being thought only to exist in legend by others. And not only is all of this news to her, according to the soundtrack, it's blowing her mind. Now, on its own, that's dumb, but it's infuriatingly dumb when you realize that all the convoluted intrigue and pretzel logic storytelling it took to get here was only in service of setting up an excuse to pause the movie so Diana can watch the trailers for Flash, Aquaman, and Cyborg, two of which are movies they might not actually make now. Oops. Oh, and this whole thing kind of creates a weird issue with her character in terms of the timeline between this and Wonder Woman, like, doesn't it? Remember at the end of this, she pretty much tells Bruce that she's been keeping to herself in between the general period of that photo and strapping the gear back on to help kill Doomsday? A hundred years ago, I walked away from mankind. From a century of horrors. In which case, as of the ending of Wonder Woman, it now seems like after winning World War I and reaffirming her faith in humankind, the only metahuman anyone had heard of until Clark Kent put on his tights a century later, apparently sat around doing nothing special about World War II, Hitler, the Holocaust, Pearl Harbor, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Stalin, Mao, the Berlin Wall, apartheid, near constant war in the Middle East, colonialist destabilization of Africa and South America, Korean War, Vietnam War, the Kennedy assassination, the other Kennedy assassination, the MLK and Malcolm X assassinations, the Nixon administration, the Reagan administration, 9-11, the Iraq War, and thousands of other disasters and tragedies, both natural and man-made, until she happened to see a dopey CGI ogre on the news while she was boarding a plane, and that, apparently, was the first thing in a hundred years that was worth busting out the magic lasso for. Men made a world where standing together is impossible. Yeah. In case you're wondering, the sum total of this issue being addressed in Justice League is one line about how she always fought when called. We aren't really told what that means. Other than that, the main new piece of information we come away with about what Wonder Woman was doing for a century was feeling bad about Chris Pine. That's it. Yes, I know they're going to spend however many Wonder Woman movies she'll sign for explaining that she was actually doing all kinds of superhero stuff that whole time, and it feels very plausible that the whole I walked away for a hundred years line was only there because Wonder Woman was maybe supposed to have a darker, more cynical, more Zack Snyder-ish ending in line with the rest of the franchise plans before they found out people hated this movie and they needed to change course, but they shouldn't have to because what's even more galling is that one more pass at the screenplay here could have fixed all of this. How? Think about it. Why is Batman, the normal human character who's hearing about all of this for the first time, the one who's revealing the existence of other metahumans to the other metahuman whose existence was only just revealed to him? That's just awful writing, awful storytelling, overcomplicated, no reason to be so. You know what would have been better? If she did already know about those files, and that was what she was trying to erase. See? See how much better this is? It streamlines the whole subplot, you still get to do the moronic but apparently necessary video watching scene, but with Bruce, and you now have an infinitely better answer than apparently nothing for what was Wonder Woman doing this whole time. She was working tirelessly in secret to cover up the existence of herself, the Amazons, and all the other special and unique super people all over the world. It's simple, it's clean, it makes more sense, and hey, hindsight being 2020, basically something that could have been a good moment if not necessarily a saving grace, instead becomes another damning nail in the film's coffin thanks to an honestly shocking level of incompetence and bad decision making in the creative process. But, perhaps incredibly, it is not the worst or most damning issue of that kind in the film. In my view, Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice is instead done in by exactly three specific sequences so monumentally bad that even if everything around them had worked, we'd still be calling this a bad film. The following three sequences are so bad and or badly executed that they effectively negate any chance the film may have otherwise ever had to be even passably good. Ooh, that's bad. But understanding how and why that is provides three separate opportunities for you to become more familiar with the tools and structure and tone as they apply to successful cinematic storytelling. That's good. But that does mean you have to both watch and think a little more about Batman v Superman. That's bad. But you'll gain improved critical thinking skills to be applied to future film-watching endeavors. That's good. But you may find it difficult to turn these skills off when attempting to enjoy something that's pleasurable on one level but objectively fails on multiple other levels. Can I go now?
Uh, okay, so let's talk about cinematic universes. As I discussed in the previous episode, I'm of the opinion that the media landscape has been changed so profoundly by streaming, instant access, and the general breakdown of separations between home and theatrical viewing, and indeed between television and film as separate mediums. Furthermore, I hold that these changes are not driven by the so-called cinematic universe multimedia phenomenon, but rather by natural and predictable evolution of the market brought about by technological innovation. Marvel and Disney did not create this new paradigm for intellectual property in the entertainment industry. They merely were the first and so far only party to recognize it and take meaningful advantage of it. Bottom line, I contend that the definitions of what constitutes expected general knowledge in popular culture have changed so much over the last decade that films attempting a shared inter-episode continuity as part of a broader franchise have a lot more leeway when it comes to references, tie-ins, cameos, shout-outs, etc., and that criticisms of that reference took me out of the movie or how am I supposed to know who that is are increasingly coming from a perspective which, in my opinion, fails to understand the reality of 21st century art and entertainment consumption. How many of you are there? Not enough. That having been said, even if the rules of this stuff have changed, you still have to do it well, and it's possible to do it poorly enough that it wrecks the movie even under these new, much looser standards. Failing to grasp this may or may not have already killed Universal's Dark Universe debacle with the crashing and burning of the mummy this past summer, but prior to that, Batman v Superman, as a result of Warner Brothers' panicked rush to convince their shareholders that they were, in fact, on top of the need to create an answer to the Avengers yesterday, lowered the bar considerably when it stopped dead in its tracks to set up the rest of its studio's planned tentpole slate by having a supporting character watch teaser trailers on a laptop. Holy shit. Again, the fact that we're doing little teases for Flash, Aquaman, and Cyborg is not itself the problem. In fact, as separate elements in and of themselves, the three video clips are actually pretty solid filmmaking for what they are. The Aquaman especially is kind of great in terms of presenting his existence as a kind of unsettling, cryptid kind of creature that had me thinking, oh, okay, cool, that's a different but very interesting take on how to realize this character in his world. I'm on board. And then we got that Justice League trailers, and no, apparently not so much. In any case, the problem with this scene isn't that it's extraneous, or that it only exists to set up other movies, or that we don't actually know or find out who the hell these people are in the context of the film. Those are all manageable things. I mean, Black Panther gets a whole subplot to himself in Captain America Civil War without any previous indication as to who he is, or that he and his accoutrement even exist because his presence and actions are important to the story, serve a clear narrative purpose, and make clear reasonable sense in the context of the rest of the film and its genre, i.e. we know we're watching a superhero movie, so a guy who's out for revenge putting on a code name and a dopey costume that gives him powers is not an unexpected occurrence any more than picking up a sword is in a samurai movie. This scene, on the other hand, has no effect on the story and serves no narrative purpose. It doesn't really change Batman's mind about anything. In fact, he doesn't seem all that interested in it, even though he's already so dead set that one superpowered individual is too dangerous to be allowed to live. We have to take it as an absolute certainty. It doesn't seem like Wonder Woman gives all that much of a shit, and it's pretty clear she didn't know about this stuff either, and it doesn't even seem to be all that much on Lex Luthor's mind, even though he apparently knew about it the longest and is the only character who brings it up at all beforehand. But there are, uh, there are more of them. The metahuman thesis. Yes, the metahuman. It's a huge piece of information that should immediately either change or recontextualize the entire central scenario of the film, or at least the actions of the three main characters, and it just doesn't. Incidentally, this would be one reason why the Marvel movies tend to stick these things at the end as little self-contained bonuses separate from the rest of the narrative. Speaking of which, what's even worse is that it's placed at exactly the wrong moment in the film in terms of pacing. We went over how the film makes absolutely no structural sense last time, but the degree to which this completely unnecessary scene stops an already nonsensical story cold is true something to behold. Think about where this scene is placed in the story. Just a hair over two hours in the extended version, right after Superman tells Lois that he has to go fight Batman and might even have to abandon all of his moral and philosophical high ground by killing him in order to save Martha Kent. Clark. No one stays good in this world. And right before, Lois tells Perry that she has to go to Gotham to intervene in the battle, indicating to the audience that it's possible that Perry White has known what's really going on here the whole time. Perry, it's not her story. Right? This is kind of an important part of the movie. The literal title fight has come to a head. Both ostensible good guys have been brought to their lowest point and are ready to compromise all of their ideals. One or both of them is all but guaranteed to die. The villain of the piece is about to be victorious and already appears to be putting a broader master plan in motion. And there's a ticking clock on the impending execution of one of our wholly sympathetic, in theory, characters. Everything for two solid hours has been building to this. In drama, we sometimes call it, cue that clip from American Dad, the all is lost moment!
And that is the point at which we're going to stop the movie dead for two solid minutes of zero context information dumping that has nothing to do with anything that's happened or will happen in this story and has zero bearing on the rest of the film, period. I, 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 I got nothing, folks. This movie cost $300 million. Actually, $300 million is what they admit to spending. The real number is probably well over $400 million, and that's not necessarily even counting an extra $100 to $150 million for worldwide marketing. I mean, god damn. Just... And it's not like this is the only way to get this stuff into the movie. I mean, it doesn't even really need to be there, period. The definition of not vital to the story at hand in this genre is so broad that it was perfectly acceptable for the Avengers to put the reveal of the actual bad guy in charge after the credits. But if you're determined to get this stuff in there, there had to be other ways. Two of our, let's say, six or seven most important characters are news reporters, right? Surely they could stumble upon some of this. Isn't Cyborg, an injured football player from the college team Perry White is so obsessed with Clark writing about? Hell, if Kryptonian Wikipedia had told Lex about mother boxes a few scenes earlier, he could have opened up his own damn files to check the cyborg one and go, oh, so that's what that is. The Flash thing happened in public and seemed to cause some damage, so there'd probably be a police report about it somewhere, right? Wouldn't the first thing everyone asked about that be, hey, was this Superman the only known being on Earth who could do something like this? And wouldn't the newspaper reporter who's sleeping with Superman, or the newspaper reporter who is Superman, hear about that? Isn't Atlantis the place Aquaman is from? part of the same Hellenistic mythological canon that Wonder Woman's home, race, patron gods, and mother all come from? Isn't it a little strange that I'm asking these questions, but the people making this movie apparently did not? What does that mean? Why did you say that name? Find him! Save Martha! Ah, oh boy, here we go. So, remember last time when we talked about intent versus execution and I said this? Even the most inexplicably stupid things in this movie were largely set in motion with the best of intentions, they were just poorly executed. But in this era where hardcore fans often spend months leading up to a movie learning everything about it except how it actually plays out, there's a tendency among said fans to assume that because they recognize how an idea worked on paper, that anyone who criticizes the result just didn't get it. Well, this scene is the main reason we have to talk about it. Save Martha was pretty much universally agreed almost immediately to be the low point of Batman v Superman. I actually disagree, I think there's one more segment that's much, much worse worse, but it's definitely the most visibly, understandably, undeniably bad part of the movie. At the dramatic peak of what feels like it should be, but actually isn't, the third act of our story, with our Christ-like, tragic, self-sacrificing hero about to be slain by our Ahab-esque, vengeance-crazed anti-hero, brandishing a literal harpoon, in case you missed the reference even, the whole thing descends into a pair of beefy, sweaty, square-chinned, grown men in Halloween costumes grunting, MARTHA! And WHY DID YOU SAY THAT NAME?! at each other for an embarrassingly long stretch of screen time. Almost everyone seems to understand that this sucks, even if they don't also comprehend that it's a microcosm of how and why the whole movie sucks. Save Martha! Martha. Why did you say that name? And yet if you bring it up, someone is going to jump out and, well, actually, your goddamn ear off about how you shouldn't criticize it because you probably just didn't understand the point behind it. Well, I do understand the point behind it, guys, and it is always guys, because it's my job to understand the point behind it, and yes, conceptually, on paper, this is a good idea. The whole point behind dragging Batman's origin story back into the narrative in the first place is that the film is working from the interpretation of the character where Batman is the manifestation of Bruce Wayne's fear of lost control. Control. He was powerless to prevent the murder of his parents, so he creates a persona that allows him to use every available resource he has to control not simply crime, but over the random, cruel injustice of crime. And the destruction of Metropolis and the death of his Wayne Building employees because of a battle between all-powerful godlike creatures with seemingly no concern for ordinary people around them represents the complete obliteration of every semblance of control he has spent a lifetime cultivating. He is once again little Bruce Wayne, small and alone, looking up at powerful forces tearing his world apart and helpless to do anything but watch as his loved ones fall down dead. That's why he breaks, that's why he turns bad, that's why he betrays everything Batman once stood for, symbolically dons a suit of armor embodying a corrupted and inhuman final evolution of that persona, and tries to hunt down and butcher a man. This may be the only thing I do that matters. Twenty years of fighting criminals amounts to nothing. Criminals like weeds, Alfred. Pull one up, another grows in its place. This is about 
about the future of the world. And then, at the moment of truth, seconds before he crosses the line of no return, the supposed enemy he has forced himself to see only as an inhuman monster who must be destroyed at all costs says something, by total cosmic coincidence, that not only reminds the Batman of the defining moment of his entire existence, but cuts to the very heart of the innocent childlike humanity that still fundamentally drives him, compelling Bruce Wayne to realize that he is now, for the first time, on the other side of the gun that cut down Thomas and Martha Wayne. Devastated at what he's become, he throws down the spear and begins his redemption with an act that is perhaps symbolically closer than any he has experienced before to the one impossible wish he will never be able to fulfill for himself. I'm not your promise. Martha won't die tonight. That's really good. As a scene outline, details to be added later, that is gangbusters. It's probably the best, if not only proper way to resolve the otherwise contrived fight scene that the whole stupid movie has been conceived to lead to. I mean, you'd still be stuck with the shitty costumes and the cheesy set lighting and Affleck being weirdly off his game and Cable just not really being all that good of an actor at this point and that disastrous score thunderously insisting on its own non-existent gravitas. <laughs> but it might have worked. It just doesn't, though, and the apparent need to build it around the name is pretty much the reason why. No one in this situation thinks they would be trying to convey what Clark is in this way. Why is he talking about his mother like Bruce is supposed to know who that is? What makes him think Batman, who he's apparently only ever heard of as a civil rights violating vigilante psychopath and now an armed nutcase about to murder him, will help her? I mean, save mother? Save her? Stop Luther? Save hostage? Yeah, those would be awkward too, but at least they aren't putting a spotlight on this meaningless but unavoidably weird fact of their moms having the same name. Incidentally, I have no way of proving it, but this is something that sounds like a studio note, i.e. someone at Warner Brothers or Legendary or Atlas or whichever entity with a producer credit wanted to make sure they were contributing and got stuck on the weird random trivia about the matching names and insisted this had to be addressed and that this was the perfect solution for the peacemaking scene. No idea, but it wouldn't surprise me at all. However it got in there, not only does it not work, seeing it play out is to watch Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice step up to the best opportunity it has to turn itself around and set itself on fire instead. It is structurally, tonally, narratively, logically the climactic moment and emotional center of your entire goddamn movie. You cannot hinge it on dialogue and line delivery so profoundly removed from recognizable human behavior that it would be perfectly at home coming out of Tommy Wiseau. You are tearing me apart, Lisa! And even if the delivery didn't kill it, the content still would. Because even though, again, for the well-actually boys and the sea lions out in the cheap seats, the structural intent here is entirely sound. If at the moment moment the audience needs to be moved and edified by the last minute reaffirmation of the Dark Knight's righteousness and Bruce Wayne's essential humanity, everyone is instead going, oh hey, their moms do have the same name. Huh, that's really weird, right? I never noticed that. Huh, any real impact this scene could have easily had? Gone. Just like that. And you know, if Lois is gonna throw herself in front of Superman anyway, does there even need to be dialogue to trigger it here? Couldn't it just be the staging of the scene that does it? Like if she had a string of pearls and they got caught on the spear and fell apart like Martha Wayne's did? Nope, nope, this is getting too long. I'm not gonna rewrite every goddamn scene. In any case, that's why Save Martha is a terribly executed scene, even if it's well-intentioned, and it is. Why did you say that name? It's his mother's name. It's still not the worst one. That dishonor goes to... The Nightmare. Holy hell, what a goddamn mess this thing is. I couldn't believe it when it was playing out in theaters. I couldn't believe it when I saw it again on home video. I can't believe I'm seeing it now. I can't believe they wrote. I can't believe they storyboarded it. I don't believe they shot it, and I can't for the life of me understand why they left it in. Because this is not just another dumb, badly executed, disposable, baffling scene. It's like an entire self-contained short film, stuck in the middle of this movie, comprised entirely of the most extreme versions of everything bad about the rest of it. A guilty plea for bad filmmaking in motion.
It's all here, folks. Ugly cinematography? Check. Cheesy costumes? Check. Surprisingly poor effects compositing seemingly staged to draw attention to its own shortcomings? Check. Bastardized characterizations including trigger-happy, gun-toting Batman and angry, murderous Superman with very tenuous rationale for their presence? Check, check, and check. Only exists to deliver gratuitous fan service that will mean nothing to most audiences and only exists in the first place to lay groundwork for sequels and someone else's woefully misunderstood concept of world building? Big check on all those. To return to the most appropriate and yet also most incendiary comparison, the the reason all the other cinematic universes so far have struggled or belly flopped while the Marvel model clicked with global audiences like almost nothing else in recent pop culture history has when it works, which is far more often than not, the universe part only has a positive or neutral setting. It adds, but it doesn't subtract. If you don't recognize a cameo from or connection to another movie or catch a reference to something from the comics that might wind up in a future movie, it doesn't matter because it doesn't derail the movie you're currently watching because getting those things is not actually required. But people who do catch it, get a nice little bonus that makes them feel like they're taking part in a cool collective cultural experience and or getting a reward for having paid attention. And if you'd like to feel that rewarded as well, Disney will happily sell you a DVD, movie ticket, or download code that does precisely that. So I'm just saying, take a weekend. I'll fly you to Portland. Keep love alive. So when Ant-Man shows up in Captain America Civil War, if you saw the Ant-Man movie, you get a nice little charge of recognition. But if you didn't see the Ant-Man movie, well, to be real about it, even if you didn't, chances are good you'd still get a little something out of it because you saw the commercials for Ant-Man, or at the very least you're aware via cultural osmosis that Ant-Man is a thing that exists because this stuff is just fucking everywhere now. Ants. Ants. Ant-Man! But it doesn't actually matter. The events of his film and the details of his character therein don't have any actual bearing on his role in Civil War, i.e. to be a fun character with a cool gimmick in one last big just-for-fun moment of the movie before our super dark gut punch of a third act where the villain scheme turns out to be an ingenious swerve, but the two largely sympathetic good guys are still gonna beat the crap out of each other and destroy the surrogate family because even though the conspiracy was a ruse, the divisions and pain that were exposed were real and tragically got the better of them in a heartbreaking but relatably human way. Wow, this really is such a better version of this whole concept. I mean, god damn. This isn't going to change what happened. I don't care. He killed my mom. Ant-Man is just another superhero in a movie full of them, and since he's utilized properly in a well-written, structurally sound, narratively satisfying way, you can enjoy it as is. Just like you can enjoy Ghostbusters without needing a Winston Zedmore origin movie, or the Blues Brothers without needing an explanation that the other band members were doing while Jake was in prison, or hell, even how Wrath of Khan still totally works even if you didn't see Star Trek 1, Space Seed, or any of the previous Star Trek stuff. The only difference with the Marvel Cinematic Universe business is that the extra info movie about Ant-Man or any of the other guys is out there so you kind of feel like you have to see it just in case and that's how they've made five billion dollars and counting off of this stuff hubba, hubba, hubba. money 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 who do you trust the Nightmare, on the other hand, is completely the opposite of all of that. In order for any of this whole sequence to make any kind of sense, or to get anything out of it as a filmgoer, you have to know about the New Gods, Planet Apocalypse, Parademons, Darkseid, Darkseid Symbol, know that they're in the same universe as Batman and Superman, know that Justice League is a thing and that this means they'll be involved in it, and even then, all that information is actually going to get you in terms of the experience of watching this film is... I understood that reference. Because nothing in here actually has any real bearing on the plot or themes of Batman v Superman. In fact, its presence just makes the whole thing make even less sense. For a full hour and five minutes leading up to the nightmare, the entire basis of our central conflict is that Bruce Wayne and Lex Luthor want to stop Superman because he's too powerful and his existence is dangerous and destructive. But now, suddenly, Bruce is having a vivid, detailed nightmare where his concern is that Superman might impose a fascist dystopian dictator with backup from an oddly specific looking winged alien army with zero connection to anything seen here or in Man of Steel? Where is any of this coming from? If it's a nightmare, it's bad storytelling because that's not how dreams and nightmares work either in real life or as narrative devices because it's not extrapolating from established themes or events or clarifying subtle implications. It doesn't even rhyme with the only other dream sequence in the movie, i.e. the bat monster busting out of Martha Wayne's tomb, which okay, shit, that also doesn't actually seem to mean anything either, but at least it feels like a dream that Bruce Wayne would be having. The figure in the dark was my destiny. I would use its image to strike terror into the hearts of those who did evil. I would ensure what happened to me would never happen to anyone else again. I would have my revenge. 
and if it's a vision or a premonition, it's even worse writing because it doesn't even end up setting the stage for any truths to be revealed or events yet to take place, and there's no precedent for visions or premonitions being a thing in the world of this film. And even then, it still wouldn't matter because it doesn't function like a premonition because Bruce doesn't learn anything new, solve a previously inscrutable puzzle, or change his view, goals, or methodology in any way. And we know this because in the very next scene, after a cameo by a character we haven't met in a context we have zero frame of reference for, presented with the time and attention befitting a relevant plot point, but only really here as naked fan service reference to a comic. <laughs> all because it might eventually feel retroactively like deliberate world building for a movie that, oops, they might not even decide to still make now, is Bruce admitting to Alfred that unretiring Batman was never actually about stopping a criminal operation in Gotham, but instead he's been scheming to steal the kryptonite to kill Superman with the entire time, meaning that a scene whose only conceivable justification for being in the movie at all would be as a cheap shortcut to pushing Batman over an edge into making a fateful decision, and it doesn't even do that because he's already made it. The whole sequence is ugly, dreary, boring, pointless stretch of cinema that runs a full five minutes, give or take, in a movie that's already overstuffed in too long, contributes absolutely nothing of value to the plot, character development, themes, or aesthetic of the film, and itself serves no other function than to desperately try to make references to the source material, fill in for the lack of comprehension of said source material, and to clumsily force in setups for upcoming tangentially related projects with no bearing on the story at hand. And it doesn't even deserve the dignity of being called a commercial for the other movies stuck in the middle of this one because they can't even guarantee that the products being advertised are actually going to be available for purchase. Hey, me again. Uh, just so we're clear, none of this pays off. I, I mean, none of this pays off. Uh, Justice League really seems to be trying its best to pretend that it never intended to have anything to do with New God stuff. So like Steppenwolf and Parademons and Mother Boxes are in the movie and they mention Darkseid once or twice and, you know, Steppenwolf calls himself one of the New Gods, but it could very well just be a reference to the old gods, like as in Zeus and various people. But otherwise, it seems like they are running far in the other direction from repurposing any more Darkseid stuff for these movies. And what's weird is you can absolutely see where all of the stuff that seems to be set up by the nightmare bullshit was supposed to go. Like, just to be clear, there's no dark side, no Omega symbol, no evil Superman, no fascist army, no anything like that, no post-apocalypse in Justice League, but it really does feel like at a certain point when this was going to be two movies or whatnot, that like maybe Justice League 1, the ending, the surprise ending was supposed to be, oh my god, evil Superman, what do we do now? And then maybe part two had something to do with fighting Darkseid on an apocalyptic Earth. Like it's all in there. There's even, you can even see where the I'm too soon, it's Lois Lane business with the Flash was supposed to pay off. But yeah, perhaps unsurprisingly, the nightmare now stands as a completely meaningless thing thing in this movie, unless they suddenly decide three or four movies down the line to suddenly make it mean something other than what it was intended to mean. Jesus, this is a mess. But for your trouble, at least you got to see Batman wasting random people with a machine gun, the globally recognized insignia of a character created by the children of Jewish American immigrants in the 1930s repurposed as an arm badge for Nazi-esque stormtroopers, that's just delightful, isn't it? And Superman torturing prisoners of war to death. Lucky you. You know, folks, I'm, I'm no prude, I'm no Puritan, and I'm no purist. My favorite movie is Robocop. I've got a copy of Salo on Blu-ray and like a dozen Takashi Miike movies, and I appreciate the importance of satire and deconstruction, especially of beloved positive icons of the status quo in a capitalist patriarchy. And I think deconstructionist DC Comics work like Dark Knight Returns, Watchmen Red Sun are important vital works. But, I, I mean, you know, these are characters where... You know, Make-A-Wish kids wear t-shirts with their logos on them because, like, it it makes them feel like they can overcome their afflictions. Stuff like that. And I'm for artist rights and free expression, but I also think you've got the right to tear down and mess with and even vandalize all of this stuff, but given what it is and what it can mean, if you're gonna do that, shouldn't there be a point to it? Shouldn't you at least have something to actually say with it other than, Heh, see that? You ain't getting that from a Marvel movie, right? <sighs> and we're still not done.
For what it's worth, just as there are three sequences that torpedo the whole endeavor, there were also a handful that are genuinely trying their very, very best to pull it out of a tailspin. Some of these we've alluded to earlier, like Wonder Woman coming in for the save at the end, or the well-meaning attempt to ground Superman's arc in a realistic imagining of how he'd be received in the modern world. But whereas those nobly intentioned elements merely fail to impact the film beyond their own presence, i.e. Gal Gadot's scene-stealing cameo didn't save this movie, but did undoubtedly help turn Wonder Woman into a gargantuan smash later on, these two misfired moments were undertaken with the best possible motive and a genuine thoughtfulness about narrative and theme totally missing from the rest of the film, but they actually blow their respective landings so profoundly that the impact reverberates throughout the whole project and makes them worth mentioning separately. That's no small feat, considering how much else is wrong with this movie. The existence of a character like Superman in reality would fundamentally alter the geopolitical situation of the planet Earth so profoundly that like most comic book superheroes, the usual approach is to just pretend that they somehow don't in their own universe so you aren't forced to eat up time explaining all the ways this reality is different instead of concentrating on the story at hand. Likewise, some of the best deconstructionist superhero stories have been the ones that actually do ask this question, like Dark Knight Returns, like Watchmen, and Ex Machina. So credit where it's due, kicking off the main plot, or the closest thing we have to a main plot, in Dawn of Justice by trying to imagine Superman's effect on something real-world relevant like a conflict zone in an impoverished geopolitically significant country is a pretty bold this is how we're different territory to stake out, and as the actual reason for doing so comes into focus, the idea behind it actually feels pretty promising. Lois Lane is reporting on the activities of a warlord in the fictional African nation of Nairobi, but it turns out that her cameraman, yes, the DCEU version of Jimmy Olsen, we talked about this at length already, is a covert CIA operative and she gets swept up in the ensuing standoff. It's okay, Lois. Superman arrives and does what Superman is expected to do in that situation, and amid the ensuing chaos, a whole bunch of innocent people wind up dead and the whole area becomes further destabilized, leaving the rest of the world looking askance at the Man of Steel going, hey, dude, what the hell? The point here, obviously, is to take Superman's popular function as a symbol of the specifically American mythology of benevolent interventionism and actually deal with the fallout more typically associated with that aforementioned real-world parallel. Okay, sure, you got the bad guy and saved or avenged whatever you were specifically concerned about, but then you took off and now everything is all fucked up. That's not cool. In the theatrical cut of the film, the bigger picture of this just kind of hovers in the background unaddressed save for the one plot point about the special bullets that serve to give Lois a reason to be in on the story. But in the extended cut, it's a lead into the subplot about the character of Kahina Ziri, who testifies to the veracity of the whole Superman's way of doing things is irresponsible and gets people hurt narrative, which is what's supposed to spur Clark Kent into getting self-righteous about Batman. He came down, then came fire. Even worse came after. The government attacked. No mercy in the villages. My parents tried to run. My family too had dreams. To look him in his eye and ask him how he decides which lives count. He answers to no one. Not even, I think, to God. But then she has a change of heart and reveals that she made it all up, i.e. Superman getting involved didn't actually cause the extra bloodshed, Luther's mercenaries did it and then forced her to lie about it in order to keep the government, and I guess also Batman, on the anti-Superman bandwagon. I didn't tell you the truth. Not only paid her, threatened her, gave her a script to learn. Her parents are alive back home. As previously discussed, this has the effect of stretching the reach and scope of Luthor's scheme to even more unnecessarily absurd lengths, and highlighting how silly it is that he's using the same apparently pretty well-known Russian bad guy to do like 90% of his dirty work. But more substantively, this means that the closest according controversy for something actually pretty gutsy in the real-world grown-up philosophical sense that the film actually inches up to, specifically looking at the classical interpretation as Superman as a projection of the United States as a geopolitical entity and saying, okay, let's talk about America as a geopolitical entity. I'm not saying he shouldn't act. I'm saying he shouldn't act unilaterally. What are we talking about here then? Must there be a Superman? There is it completely chickens out and backs away from. Robbing this character of her initial agency, throwing away the thematically powerful plot point of a black woman telling an embodiment of the presumptive white savior complex that he needs to question his sense of self, hey hey, that would have had shades of Dennis O'Neill and Neil Adams' legendary politically charged recontextualizing of Green Lantern and Green Arrow in 1970 even. How about that? As a cheesy shortcut to pump up the Luthor's master plan storyline. <laughs> 
And actually, chickens out is the charitable interpretation. If you choose to assume that undermining the very idea that even Superman should question Superman's actions was the foundational intended point of this, well, suffice to say, it starts to take on a pretty gross extra dimension in context with the rest of the narrative, because it effectively creates a scenario where the lesson of the movie is that not only crazy-ass Bruce Wayne, but pretty much anyone who dares to suggest that the guy whose name is removed from Nietzsche only by quirk of language shouldn't just do whatever he thinks is right because he was born too strong for anyone to stop him is both wrong about that and unwittingly fitting into the schemes of the quote-unquote real menace, which doesn't even fit with where this film seems to want us to end up with the whole inspirational martyr angle. But hey, what hero narrative doesn't sound a little close to might makes right in the broad strokes? Eh, it's not like any of the voices of moral authority actually vocalize that sort of sentiment explicitly. What was I supposed to do? Just let him die? Be their hero. Be their monument, be their angel, be anything they need you to be. Maybe. Or be none of it. You don't owe this world a thing. Huh. Huh. Okay, put a pin in that one for later, because I got another one of these to get to. As I said earlier, aka in the first half, the big Batman v everybody fight scene that looks yanked out of one of the Arkham video games is just about the only thing this movie does not just competently, but better than most previous incarnations did. Snyder can block the shit out of a fight scene, Affleck and or the stunt team look terrific in motion, and taken as its own self-contained thing, there's basically nothing wrong with it, save for at least five or six of these guys absolutely being straight up dead, but hey, that also happened in Batman Returns, so yeah. Point is, good scene, except that its placement and execution within the narrative represent yet another bizarrely awkward bungling of a fairly straightforward thematic device, which, yes, does unfortunately make the mess of the movie a little bit worse. See, yes, this fairly long and involved version of the hero runs into a place and rescues somebody scene is here for a specific narrative purpose. This is Batman v Superman's equivalent to- I'm always angry. signaling that something has been reaffirmed. In this case, hooray! Batman is Batman again! Notice I didn't put an I think or seems to be qualifier on that because I don't need to. As sloppy as this film's structure is, the intended thematic arc of these sequences is obvious. Batman and Superman were both debased, degraded, and brought to their lowest by the preceding fight to the almost death and everything that led up to it, but having emerged without either having stepped over the line of no return, both men are symbolically restored to their true selves as indicated by embarking on missions grounded in their most familiar conceptions. Superman flies off to confront Lex Luthor in the middle of another mad science experiment, and Batman literally discards the weight of his anger armor, returns to his traditional costume, and saves an innocent civilian by fighting off a room full of punks using his gadgets and training, and as a bonus, gets some psychological closure by proxy. Save Martha! Here's the problem with that execution-wise. Remember before when we talked about how the film can't make up its own mind about whether we're supposed to take these characters as adaptations of their familiar selves or as radical deconstructions thereof and tries unsuccessfully to have it both ways? Well, this is the place where that really matters. The only way for this sequence to work as a return to glory for Batman is for the audience to have already understood that the suspect branding, vehicular manslaughtering, xenophobic hate crime almost committing Batman that we've been watching for the past two hours is not the normal Batman. That he's fallen tragically from what he once was. That's not even an interpretation of the subtext, that's the text. New rules. We're criminals, Alfred. We've always been criminals. Nothing's changed. Oh, yes it has, sir. Everything's changed. It's the entire arc of his character throughout the film and clearly a setup that was meant to carry through all the way into the subsequent Justice League franchise. But Batman v Superman itself, as a film, gives us zero indication that that's the case. This is the first time we've ever seen Ben Affleck's DCEU Batman do anything like this outside of the nightmare scene, which is either supposed to be a dream or a vision of a possible future, so it doesn't really count in this context. The first time we see Batman in the movie proper, he's doing the slithering on the walls like a monster to indicate diminishment of humanity thing and then already 
branding guys. Then it's the, whoa, Batman has a rifle, but oh wait, it's not to shoot bullets, but still, holy shit, Batman with a rifle is a big deal, fake out borrowed from Dark Knight Returns that even Frank Miller understood to be a visual shorthand for the character heading down a darker path. Then he definitely murders like four or five people with the Batmobile, which it is subsequently revealed is not part of a crime-fighting mission, but because he's trying to steal Lex's anti-Superman weapon to use himself, that's the twist. Oh no, Batman has been far gone this whole time. Then it's finally time to put on the big bulky I am become a literal monster symbolism armor. That's it. That's our three Batman scenes prior to this one, and they're all gradually intensifying variations on the theme of self-corruption. Again, not my interpretation, it's the plot of the movie. I failed him. Life. I won't fail him in death. As a result, what's meant to be thematically the triumphant return of the true Batman can't register as such, again, thematically, the intent still being obvious on the page in terms of structure, because we've never seen him before he supposedly went away. Now sure, like I said before, that's not automatically a deal breaker in my opinion, because who in 2017 doesn't know who Batman is, but A, that doesn't mean there's no limit on what you can reasonably expect an audience to know, and B, your ability to lean on stuff like that lessens considerably when you're also constantly telling that same audience that they can't can't refer back to their prior conceptions of these characters for clarity. You don't get to preemptively dismiss more than half your storytelling decisions for over two hours with, hey, hey, this is not your father's Superman and Batman, and then also dismiss the foregoing of basic character and story clarity later with, what, haven't you seen a Batman movie before? The first sentiment lessens the intended dramatic impact of the second, ultimately to the point of no return in the case of this film, and completely negates the resonance of this specific fight scene, because the entire sentiment that it's been placed at this point in the storyline to convey is nothing short of, hooray, it's your father's Batman. <laughs> However long you're imagining that took, Probably significantly longer. What's meant to be a soaring, cathartic, audience-applauding, wildly emotional highlight of this story, a setup for the not-so-fast gut punch of Doomsday showing up one scene later, because everyone knows what that means, instead registers more like, Oh, cool, I also enjoyed that recent series of video games. Or, wow, what a great fight scene. I can't wait to watch it separated on its own on YouTube, possibly redubbed with Danny Elfman and or Shirley Walker music. Like so much else we've covered so far, it's a simple and thus utterly perplexing failure of storytelling. One scene somewhere in the staggeringly unnecessary two hours before this spent making Bruce Wayne come to a decision we already saw him come to in the first five minutes, no, I'm not letting that go, showing us Batman in his prime to rhyme with this one, or even just some tangible indication of what this version of Batman was before presumably the completely incomprehensible to half the audience event being memorialized in this glass case took place, would have been a huge difference here. It wouldn't even necessarily need to be a flashback. We could learn about it from Alfred, or the Gotham City Police, or the older guy who's been running a newspaper forever and knows he's called the Batman. Or what about those people in Gotham City Clark Kent questions about Batman? Well, gee, Mr. Kent, I can tell you if this is Batman, he sure is different now. Back in the day, Batman would beat up whole rooms full of guys with all these gadgets and weapons, even just to save one person. But he didn't go around killing people. Heck, I don't even think he ever used a gun. I mean, that wouldn't solve the whole problem, but it would be a start, and in the absence of anything like that, this otherwise justly praised action scene becomes just another awkward, extraneous tangent in a movie comprised of almost nothing but those. Believe me, I'll do it! I believe you. Okay, so here we are once again at the moment of, I don't want these things to be two hours long a piece or I'll never finish them in time, so here's a summation to hopefully make what's actually a somewhat arbitrary cutting off point feel like a logical ending. Yeah, uh, if you didn't get the memo, this is actually going to go to a part three. What does that mean?
to be honest, while I was initially sort of annoyed at having to go to just a two-part thing, I'm happy for the response, but I don't want the sheer scale of the one and only really that bad experiment to eclipse the broader mission of really that good, but hey, that's on me. At this point, I'm kind of thankful for it working out that the last section gets to be its own episode, because now the way it sorts out is that part one was the basic overview, thesis, and some obligatory technical critique. Part two, as you hopefully just got done watching, is almost entirely about narrative, theme, and story structure, and part three will now end up being overwhelmingly focused on the role of creators, mainly Zack Snyder, but also the various screenwriters involved, and the influence or lack thereof of the various bits of source material this has all been culled from. And you know, since I always end up realizing I always need another paragraph here or there, presumably there will also be something about Justice League in there, eventually. In any case, look for that coming soon. For now, I think I'd like to wrap this one up with some clarification. See, the whole thesis behind Really That Good is that even though the idea of someone having a favorite movie that they love for completely subjective reasons, or reasons not related at all to what they'd even concede were the tangible quality of the thing, not everything about appraising a work is entirely subjective, and therefore the forces both within and without a piece of popular culture that leads to it becoming a classic or just part of the accepted canon can be examined and studied. And the point of that isn't necessarily to so much prove quality or give anybody ammo to justify why they like a thing, though sure, if that's your takeaway, that's fine too, so much as it is to demonstrate the why and how through something like near-universal reference points. Basically, understanding why a film elicited the response it did from you and the forces, intentional and unintentional, behind it doing so is, if not strictly educational, can at least be a learning experience. And the reason this Batman v Superman project got so long is mainly that the film is so much a product of so many different voices and factors, and so relatively recent compared to previous subjects, that as I was writing it, the sheer number of learning experience that could be extrapolated from understanding how something this involved turned out so bad just kept increasing in number and overall volume, which becomes especially apparent in Part 3. That having been said, something that came up a lot in this episode, and will also be prominent in Part 3 as well, is examining the specific flaws of this film that can be directly traced to an attempt to either change, update, or subvert some of the aspects of the characters or pre-existing source material from whence they were drawn. And that brings up something I feel I need to clarify. A film being adapted from an existing work coming out badly, in part because of a change having been made to some aspect of the original work in the process of adaptation, is something that happens a lot, and when it does, fans of the original material or just fan culture period will often point to this and say, see, this proves that sticking to the source and giving the fans what they want is the key to success. This has become especially problematic when it comes to the last decade or so of superhero movies having been so overwhelmingly dominated by the Marvel Cinematic Universe, which indeed owes a lot of its success to keeping true to the comics in ways that previous eras of the genre largely did not, keeping things colorful and loosely defined in terms of genre, embracing the shared universe concept that's been the norm in comics since the 60s, letting the costumes and designs adhere to the original drawings or at least not dressing everyone in black rubber, by now you know the drill. And it's been easy for comic book fanboys, myself often included, to point to this, particularly in light of the DCEU continuing to be a slow motion train wreck outside of Wonder Woman, and saying, aha, see, we were right all along. Hollywood should have just listened to us all this time when we were demanding literal one-to-one -one translations of our favorite comics instead of letting snooty filmmakers rub their personal vision all over it, and Marvel proves it. Not a great plan. And Batman v Superman certainly doesn't do much of a favor to any arguments in the other direction, in large part because Zack Snyder is, if nothing else, a capital A auteur filmmaker with a very specific personal vision. So if you're looking to make the argument that a producer-driven, director-for-hire, studio veto applied liberally production model that prioritizes maintaining and expanding the brand of particular characters in their worlds is preferable for the superhero set than letting filmmakers with bold alternative takes do whatever they want, the mess that is the radically Snyderized DC Extended Universe versus the frankly astonishing track record of the Marvel project feels like a pretty compelling way to frame it. But here's the thing. The reason that adaptations which radically depart from their source material often don't work can be much more easily explained by the thesis of this series. Things that are popular and beloved generally are so for a good reason, and since the books, comics, TV shows, etc. that get turned into movies in the first place tend to be chosen because they are popular and beloved already, well, there you go. But it's also not always the case, and if you'd like proof of that, go watch Kubrick's version of The Shining, which barely resembles the Stephen King book, and then watch the TV movie version that did stick to the source material and is just awful. From where I sit, the success of the Marvel movies is directly related to their default reverence for the original comics, but it's not primarily the result of or about the mere presence of mostly superficial stuff like continuity, infinity stones, references, cameos, or even keeping up the original costumes, even though I do love all those things and I'm sure they contribute somewhat to my generally positive view of the whole franchise thing. But they're not the source of the success. What they are is evidence of the source, the most visible manifestation of the mindset that drives the engine of the whole experiment. Simply put, in my estimation, Marvel succeeds by not 
being ashamed of making superhero movies in the first place, by viewing the stories and characters they had as having proven their worth already and thus being capable of providing a template for their own success, rather than being simply a property of dubious cultural distinction purchased by a film studio that might be able to turn it into a worthwhile movie with enough creative reworking, which, let's face it, has been the default approach to the genre for pretty much every major attempt made at it, even when the result was a good movie, by everyone not named Richard Donner or Sam Raimi. But while things like Captain America, Iron Man, Doctor Strange, etc. getting to keep their ridiculous looking fashion sense and color schemes are appreciated, they aren't the secret, they're simply linked to the secret. A production mindset that looks at the guy with the basically magic boomerang shield dressed like a flag and says, well, it's weird, but it's been working for us for over 75 years, so let's give it a shot, is a production mindset that also looks at Nicole Perlman's original pitch for the way, way the hell out there, and let's remember, very different from the original comics, Guardians of the Galaxy movie and James Gunn's subsequent further reworking thereof and says, yeah, pretty crazy and weird, but this exact flavor of crazy and weird has been selling a lot of comics for us over the decades, so let's give that a shot too. Warner Brothers' approach to the DC Universe, on the other hand, has thus far been largely the opposite of that. I don't know! I would not let them tell me! Mainly comprised of films that either seem embarrassed by their source material, an approach which, to be fair, did result in great films for Christopher Nolan two out of three times, or more interested in deconstructing said source material as a cultural symbol. Superman Returns wasn't about its own story, nearly as much it was about pop culture's collective nostalgia for the Christopher Reeve movies, Man of Steel is alternately about making up for returns, not being dark or action-packed enough, and is much more interested in Superman as a metatextual symbol than a three-dimensional character in his own story. Batman v Superman wants to be about a lot of big ideas, but it mostly ends up being about the negative reaction to Man of Steel's ending, i.e. the world is imperiled and Superman winds up dead in large part because Batman and a bunch of other people overreacted to the destruction of Metropolis sequence just like the audience did. And now we have Justice League, as of this writing, currently limping to the finish line with the lowest grossing opening weekend box office of the entire mega franchise thus far, playing out as one half of a paint-by-numbers generic superhero team-up story and one half totally bonkers, weirdly re-edited, part Snyder, part Whedon, part who even knows apology for Batman v Superman. But just because the mentality behind these failures goes hand in hand with decisions like Robin should be dead before the movie starts, the Joker should be more down with current trends and alternative club fashion, or turn the color saturation way down so Superman doesn't look so childish, it does not automatically follow that the lack of red underpants, yellow ovals, checkered body stockings, white stars, red balloons, green clovers, pink hearts, blue moons, invisible jets, or crypto the super dog are anywhere near the definitive reasons for why this flaming shit show is a flaming shit show and I'd be disappointed in myself as a communicator if anyone did take that away from any portion of this analysis, particularly since one of the main aspects in which Batman v Superman specifically self-destructed related not to comic book changes, but rather to ideas and concepts pulled wholesale from the comics and presented, no doubt intended, as gifts of appreciation to loyal and observant fanboys, but land in disastrous shambles thanks to a misunderstanding or ideological misappropriation of their original context. And that's something we'll be getting into big time in part three and then I'm done. For real this time. And now God bends to my will. Hey gang, here's a question that keeps coming up. If your handle is Movie Bob, where are your movie reviews? Well, my old reviews are in a lot of places. You'll find many of them on my YouTube channel, but you'll find the brand new ones on Geek.com, an awesome site that's also your one-stop news source for science, TV, gaming, technology, nerd culture, the works. You can find all my reviews directly by going to Geek.com slash author slash B Chapman, because that's my real name, and you can get regular updates on all my reviews and all of Geek.com's other great content by signing up for their kick-ass newsletter at subscribe.geek.com. 
Geekdom.com. And don't forget to also subscribe to the Geekdom.com YouTube channel, where you'll find the videos that accompany my reviews and tons of other great content too. Remember, that's Geekdom.com, the Geekdom newsletter, and Geekdom on YouTube. Make sure you don't miss out on all the latest Movie Bob reviews. You can also check out my own new website, Movie Bob Central, where you'll find my blog, links to all my work, and shop for my books, ebooks, and future Movie Bob products. And please remember to like these videos, share them with all of your friends, and subscribe to this channel. Thank you for watching another Movie Bob production.